Hi, and welcome to the Bruce Channel. I'm Bruce. Lots going on. Lots going on. Some old, some new. <laughs> We're not going borrowed or blue. Maybe a little blue. Anyway, all right, so old. I mentioned last week that someone showed growing new romaine lettuce out of the old romaine lettuce, and I said I'd begun. I didn't mark the date, but I'd begun it on Friday or Saturday, a week ago. Tuesday, I took this picture. I discovered since that it's probably a good idea to keep a little water on the very top of it, and also, um, on subsequent ones that I've done, I've cut a very slim, thin slice from the bottom just to get rid of the brown part, the oxidized part. So what I may also do is put in a drop or two of plant food in the water, but, you know, it's not a home run yet, but we're still up at bat. Also from last week, I'd mentioned the arrival of autumn, and I happened to notice the time, 1021 a.m. on Thursday, and I, you know, it's not very far off, so I set a timer so to not miss it, and then I thought, hey, why not try it? Why not try to balance the egg? So I got an egg, and instead of waiting for the magic moment of 1021 Thursday morning, I began trying then. It was probably 1012 or so. And I thought, you know, if the sun is really going to cross the equator, would a couple of minutes make that much difference? Probably not. Now, <laughs> I know I can be verbose and I can be a bit of a rock on tour, and I know I often want to embellish a good story, but I do not lie. I got the egg to balance. And as I began doing so, you know, it didn't feel like it was going to be that difficult. I thought it was close, and I did it. And it wasn't yet 1021, but so what? It was pretty close. I went to get my camera. There was a piece of paper that I wanted to get out of the pictures, and as I removed it, the egg fell over. So it took another minute or two, but it, it really is a delicate feat, but I got it. I swear to you, this egg isn't being held up artificially, and it's not a still frame. You can see it is a movie. I really did it. Then I thought, well, wait, is this really special? So I tried again on Friday using the same egg. And for the first several seconds, I thought, wow, this is going to be way hard. It really does seem to make a difference. It's not even close, but it, it got to be okay. And, you know, I don't think I worked on it more than 40 seconds, and I got it to stay upright. So now what? Is the sun being within a day of the equinox, of the equator, near enough to have the same effect? Or... Instead, do we need several months to negate that, that effect when the, when the sun is so pronouncedly at the equator? What if it's a month from now? Anyway, maybe it was the egg. You know, I did use the same one, but it, it had some imperfections. What if those imperfections made a little bit of a stand, made a little guidepost for it to stand on? So I did try again on Friday, but with a different egg. This whole exercise isn't science, it's just a bit of fun. So I tried it with the second end, second egg, and I did it for about a minute and a half, and I was really close a couple of times, but I didn't stay with it. So maybe I would have got it, maybe not. I didn't have a lot of optimism. Maybe it was the sun in those few minutes from between eggs that it moved too far south, and maybe the second egg surface imperfections weren't as compatible with the, uh, the goal. So it's not proof. But I will try this again in a couple, three weeks, maybe with the first egg, and we'll see, because that one I've done twice. All right, I also mentioned last week, Tropical Storm Julia had no effect here, except for some clouds, and it didn't have strong winds for very long. It was downgraded very quickly, but the problem is it just meandered and then stopped off our coast. And so in some parts of eastern North Carolina, you may have seen more floods, and yes, a disaster area. On the hot street, that's also left over. We're still at 55, you know, 55, 90 degree plus days. And we're only supposed to have 28, so the doubling of that number is not such a big deal, but it has been a hot summer. How hot was it? It was so hot that back in August, or maybe July, I saw two trees chasing a dog. Okay, I'll tell you, hot wasn't the big story here this week. Certainly not at the beginning of the week. 
And probably if you watch the news a bit, you may have seen the story that's developed over the weekend, last weekend. The Colonial Pipeline developed a leak in Alabama. That meant they had to shut it down, and that meant that gas wasn't getting to, what, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas, Georgia, a lot of us. And I'll tell you, it was spooky. Last weekend, I didn't get gas. I had a half a tank or so, and I wasn't that concerned, but I did see the pump price a week ago, and it was just above $2. By Tuesday, it was getting hard to find a station. People were in social media. Well, they have some, but it's only premium, and this and that was going around. And uh, it was getting hard to get gas, and it was especially hard for the independent stations, you know, the, the unaffiliated. I went to the Exxon station, and they had signs all over. They had no gas either, so now it's getting a little bit serious, you know. As far as I know, nothing was shut down, not the schools. The mail came, the school buses ran, but I suspect it might have been a little bit more difficult for the landscapers. Anyway, Tuesday afternoon, it just seemed very quiet. I live on a, on a state route, a two-lane highway, and it's, you know, it's not bumper to bumper, but it's, there's traffic. It just seemed quieter, so maybe folks were doing what I was, which was essential trips only. I was going to use my van to help a friend pick up a, a small furniture piece. It really wasn't big, but it was too big for her car. But we agreed, all right, this isn't essential. Let's save it till we get gas. And then the next day she phoned me and said, Sheets has gas. And that was in the morning. It was 2.29 compared to earlier, you know, the last time I'd seen it was like 2.01 or 2.02. 2.29. So I did go get some in the car, and then that afternoon we went in the van to help her pick that up. Just in those few hours, from morning to early afternoon, at Sheets, it had dropped from 2.29 to 2.25. But the Exxon station that I'd gone to see was near where the furniture was, and they had gas too, and it was 2.12. <laughs> so anyway, by week's end, things were back to normal, but for a while, it was a little bit dicey. But of course, if you follow the news, you know that's not the only North Carolina news. In Charlotte, we had an incident, a shooting of a black man by the police, and that was touched off by a few days and nights of protests and some rioting on Wednesday night. Thursday night, there were protests, but no rioting. And even though there was a midnight curfew, the police elected to not enforce it because it was peaceful. Now, I'm not near Charlotte, but neither am I that far. There are two versions. Police say he wouldn't put down his gun, but the neighbors all say he didn't have a gun, that he was in his car reading a book. He did it every day, waited for his kid to home, come home from school. Said to do that every day. So there is video, but the public hasn't been allowed to see it. Anyway, of course, it was... Everybody's nerves were on edge here and everywhere because just a day or two previously, there was a black man shot by a white police officer in Tulsa. And in that one, there's two videos, one actually from the dash cam and the other from the helicopter, police helicopter above. And it isn't absolutely conclusive, and the audio isn't clear either, but it is clear in the video that he has his hands in the air. Late in the week, the officer who fired that shot was charged. Now, I'm not taking sides here. Uh, that's why there are courts. That's why there are juries. You, you get the facts. But were I black? I would feel more nervous, and if stopped, I'm going to very ostentatiously obey every little thing. My hands are up. I'm not moving. You know, should that be necessary? Probably not. Is it necessary? Probably not. Most of the time. Hey, let me tell you about my book, Shrink. Or wait, I can let others do it.
All right, welcome back. Remember, you can write to us at the Bruce Channel at yahoo.com. Hopefully, I've not been hacked. <laughs> and you can watch all of our previous episodes at tinyurl.com slash Bruce Channel. You can subscribe at that site. You can also uh, like it and share it, and you can also watch our episodes on our Facebook page. You know, not long ago, I didn't know who Alex Jones was, but the more I learn, the more he seems beyond the pale. Now, earlier this past week, he wasn't the most frothy he's ever been, but one day this week, he, he really, 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 really got wound up. But in Sweden and Germany and France, they're putting ads on saying, you are demoralized, you are dead, you are over, give up to the hajib, give up to Muhammad and Allah! Allah Akbar! We're going to stab your daughter at the mall! We're going to stab your wife, your son! We're going to stab you with a butcher knife! And then the police chief's going to get up and say, We love our Somalis! We love our Muslims! Oh, they're so good! Oh, they're so sweet! And I will be... You know what? I will go to... I will go to hell! Before I sit here and I watch this country and the world turned over to these savages. I'm done, I'm pissed, and I'm not putting up with it anymore. You, let me tell you something, you filthy traitors of the government, you pieces of crap. You are the most degenerate, twisted, mentally ill people I've ever seen wanting to gang rape this republic and this country and the West that has been the literal cornerstone, the, 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 the absolute jewel in the crown. I am so sick of these people. But I'll tell you the good news. That lying witch, Hillary Clinton, is on her last legs. And so thank you, God. Thank you for the hand of doom coming against her. I don't wish her any harm, but I wish you to, to, to have judgment on Hillary Clinton. I want everyone to pray for So, judgment. you know, again, not long ago I hadn't heard him. But if you recall, he's been saying Hillary is passing out once or twice an hour. She can hardly hold herself upright. And she's having fits and mini strokes and... Oh, not this past week, but the week before, he said he thought she'd drop out of the race by the end of this week. Okay, well, Alex, I don't want you to be right. If you are, I will acknowledge. But at my deadline, she hasn't dropped out yet. And Monday night, debate number one, Hillary against Donald, moderated by Lester Holt. Now, she's as ill as Alex Jones and others have been saying, essentially knocking on death's door, really. I think we're going to likely notice come Monday, if she hasn't dropped out by then. Now, you know, if she drops out or shows these manifestations of dementia, I will acknowledge Mr. Jones' perspicacity. We'll see how Donald does, too. We know he will yell. But will he actually have bothered to study, to learn details? He hasn't yet. One thing we do know about Hillary, she is a policy wonk. She loves the stuff. She loves her details. She loves the minutia. That's what wonks do. In fact, that's one of her biggest flaws as a candidate. She's wonky. She's the smartest kid in the class. And sometimes that person, that person isn't so well liked sometimes. Anything. Anyway, one thing that I'm pretty sure of. Well, we don't know how he'll answer or what he'll say. If either Lester Holt or Hillary Clinton asks him tw tough questions, you know, in the same way that Megyn Kelly did, it's hard to believe that's over a year now, isn't it? His reaction is likely to be similar. It's rigged. It's unfair. He has said a lot that is stupid. <laughs> but then he gets mad at reporters who report what he said. In some cases, then, he's banned the reporters. Anyway. We'll find out. Oh, and then just a few days ago, this occurred to me. Think of it. These are both baby boomers. Baby boomers took over everything. Music, hairstyles, clothing, everything. Simply by virtue of their sheer numbers. Schools had to be built. Houses had to be built. What baby boomers wanted, marketing departments tried to provide. That's changing. Baby boomers are now retired, or retiring, or soon to retire, and hand in glove with that, dying, you know? So on one hand, 
many of the baby boomers who grew up with America, you know, astride the world as Colossus, they are dismayed that America no longer is that. Never mind that it was going to be unsustainable. So to those boomers, this is all disoriented. Donald Trump cannot take us back in time. He cannot. Would it be nice? Well, for some of us, sure. How far back? But it doesn't matter. He cannot do it. No matter how much someone wishes it, it cannot be done. Now, blow out the candles and make a wish. It's... <laughs> he can't. Even his basic premise that our leaders are stupid makes no sense. The world is a complex place. The greatest minds in the world are simultaneously trying to figure out ways to solve complex problems. And one of the problems with doing that is that there are legitimate competing interests. You know? Hillary isn't going to solve everything either. Like Donald, she's a baby boomer. If he's elected, he will be the old, oldest first-term president ever at 70. If she's elected, she'll be the second oldest behind only Ronald Reagan. Now, many of her followers are also baby boomers. Baby boomers, also called the free love generation, <laughs> started the march toward equality. Women could be more than nurses and teachers, and did. It is a logical step that a baby boomer might become the first woman president. But here's the thing. The baby boomers are running out of candidates. Not completely. But the youngest from this year's field were Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, born in 71 and 70, respectively. The last baby boomers were born in 64. All right, news out of California surprised me this week. An Air Force U-2 airplane on a training mission got into trouble and crashed. Both pilots ejected, but one got killed. At my deadline, it's still not known if the chute didn't deploy correctly or maybe if he hit debris from the plane. It's just not, not known, or at least I don't know. But I was really surprised by the news. The U-2? Really? That is the spy plane, launched back in the 1950s. Famously, Francis Gary Powers was shot down by the Soviet Union. He was flying over the Soviet Union. We thought that the height at which it flown, 70,000 feet, that's, you know, twice an airliner. We thought at that height, they can't shoot us down. We're spying on them. They caught us. And President Eisenhower denied it. Flat out lied. Until the Soviets produced the captured pilot alive on television. Oops. Hello, Boy Scouts. Can you spell honor? There was supposed to be a summit between Eisenhower and Soviet Premier Khrushchev, but that got scotched. It was also the U-2 that took the pictures over Cuba in 1962, revealing the Soviets replacing offensive missiles 90 miles from our shore. And here, all these years later, we learn they're still in use? Really? Most U-2s are single-seaters, but for training they have two, and they're apparently hard to fly. They can fly way high because they're thin, and their wings are incredibly long way, way long, like twice what the length of the plane is. They need that length to provide enough lift, but it also makes them hard to fly. No official word, but it may have been that very hard to fly issue that caused it to go down. But I was surprised just to learn it's, we're still flying the thing, you know, 60 years later. With drones and satellites, why are we still flying? Ah, why are we flying it? Because Lockheed builds them in California, and California's got congressmen. Same old, same old. All right, the upcoming week is the last week of the Major League Baseball season. And the Cleveland Indians <laughs> have had a great season. But, uh, you know, just recently two of their starting pitchers were lost for the rest of the season, which makes the outlook bleak. That maybe wasn't always so, but in today's sports world, just about any sport, it is. Take last year's NBA playoffs. The Cavaliers were manhandling everyone, but as they were heading into the finals, they lost first Kevin Love and then Kyrie Irving, and that's two of the three best players. James LeBron is a superstar, yes, but he does need help. This year, all three healthy, they won the championship. In football, back in the day, there was a championship. Then there were two games, the AFC and NFC champions. They played a Super Bowl. But the championships were played in December, for heaven's sake. 
So if a pretty good team had some luck and inspired play and maybe their opposition had an injury, you only needed to win one game, and with the exception of the Super Bowl, you only had to win twice. But the owners in football and over time, all the sports decided, let's make playoffs. Then, let's make more playoffs, and thus more money. So, what's changed is even if a pretty good team plays inspired ball and does get a little look, a pretty good team is still not likely to get through all of the playoffs. Same thing in baseball. In 1954, the best team in baseball was the Cleveland Indians. They won more regular season games, 111, than any other American League team in history. Yes, it was later eclipsed by both the Yankees and the Mariners. But in 1954, the season was only 154 games, eight fewer than they play today. In baseball, though, if you got hot, if one player got hot or one pitcher, when the World Series was it, American versus National League, League best of seven, you know, maybe you just needed a little luck or a hot streak. You only needed to win four games. You really needed two good pitchers and a little luck, or maybe a good bullpen, or maybe rain. The old Braves used to say, spawn and same and pray for rain. 1954, 1954 that record-setting team caught a very hot team, the Giants, and lost in four straight. That could happen today, but those Giants today, a team has to have more than a hot streak to move deep into the playoffs. I know the people of Cleveland are the people of Believe Land, and they believed in June when the Cavaliers won the NBA championship. It would make a great story. And here's the thing, while a city enjoying simultaneous championships in different sports isn't exactly rare, it does take some extraordinarily good fortune, especially in today's world where, wow, the playoffs last forever, don't they? Yeah. All right, so it wouldn't be right to talk about baseball and the 2016 season without mentioning the man who's broadcast more games than anyone, the man who was the youngest man to ever broadcast a World Series game, he was only 25, the man who even non-Dodgers fans know and like and admire and whose voice millions the world over know. He's even imitated by uh, Spanish-speaking baseball announcers and Japanese-speaking baseball announcers. And his name, Vin Scully. And he will broadcast his last baseball game next Sunday, October 2nd. And it wasn't only his voice, but the way he could, you know, remember sportscaster calling a live event or speaking extemporaneously and he could speak off the cuff with a sentence structure that was almost poetic and sometimes sometimes it's just fake but some indelible moments happen in sports sometimes sometimes he was there like this no strikes Aaron waiting the outfield deep and straight away Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. High fly ball into right field. She is gone. Third and three. We'll see a pick of some kind on the right side, possibly. Montana. Looking, looking. Throwing in the end zone. John Miller himself is a legendary baseball announcer. He thinks Vin Scully is the best of all time. John Miller also does a mean Vin Scully impression. You know, most of us, we just speak English. We say, me, Charlie Steiner, Rick Monday, we say, here's the one, one pitch, a curveball, outside, ball two, right? We just, you know, we just, but Vinny's much more elegant than that, right? Vinny's like, the one, one pitch on the way, curve, low, ball two. Vin Scully has called Dodger games for 67 years. He's 88 years old, and next Sunday, he retires. By the way, all this baseball talk today is because I'll be busy working on a picture for the next couple of weeks in Raleigh, and around in that time, too, I'll also be heading to Greenville, South Carolina, and hoping to make a trip to Atlanta, which makes it likely, not impossible, but likely we'll be away for a couple, three weeks. Will we? <laughs> Do geese see God? I don't know, however long it is, one, two, or even three weeks. 
I hope they or it is or are I'm getting confused now the best you've ever had. <laughs> Do geese see God? 